This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with thousands of topics to explore across design, business, art, music, and more. Skillshare is giving away a free trial of premiums to the first thousand people who use my link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Regular viewers of Geographics know that we love our microscates, and they also know that we like to measure surface areas in terms of football fields. Today's destination is indeed a microstate, so micro that its surface is barely equivalent to 0.73 football fields. Welcome to the Principality of Sealand, just off the British coast. Depending on your point of view, this may just be a windswept, rusty relic of war, but it may also be one of the tiniest nations on Earth. But don't let size fool you. This principality's short history is replete with larger-than-life characters, piracy, conspiracies, and even a coup d'etat. The Principality of Sealand, or Sealand for short, is located in the North Sea, some seven nautical miles off the coast of Suffolk, east of England. It boasts a population of 26, which can happily gallivant around its main surface, a platform of steel measuring 36 by 15 meters. If it wasn't clear already, Sealand's entire territory consists of an artificial structure supported by two gigantic hollowed-out concrete pillars firmly planted on the ocean floor. The current ruler of Sealand is Prince Michael Bates, son of the first prince and founder Roy Bates. In 1966, this retired army major was frustrated by the restrictive rules on broadcast radio. Taking advantage of a loophole in international maritime law, he seized the initiative. Rather than breaking the rules, he would make his own by founding his own independent country. But let me proceed in order. To better understand the story of Prince Roy, we have to go back to the times of another visionary leader. Napoleon Bonaparte. I'm sure neither of them will mind the comparison. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British Royal Navy tried to attack Mortella Point on the island of Corsica, but were repelled by a round fortress armed with cannons. The British borrowed the idea. They built some 140 similar towers from Scotland to East Sussex to protect the British coast. Fast forward to World War II, and Britain was facing the threat of another seaborne invasion, this time from Germany. Commander E.C. Shankland and engineer Guy Mournsall resurrected the Martello concept to design a small defensive fort protecting the Thames estuary. The fort would rest on the seabed, but it would rise above the water level, kind of like a fortified platform on stilts. These structures became known as Mornsell Forts, sentinels of concrete and metal standing fast against the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine. Naturally, with the end of the war, all the forts were decommissioned and tore down. All except three, Knock John, Sunkhead, and Fort Ruffs. The latter had been first erected in 1942. It had been manned by 300 Royal Navy personnel who used it as an anti-aircraft platform. Ruffs was sporadically used until its final evacuation in 1956, and then it was left to rust. The fort was located seven nautical miles off the English coast, and this meant that by 1950s standards, it stood in international waters. In other words, it was outside of the UK's jurisdiction. The government took this as a piece of good news. It was not their problem problem and they could save themselves the demolition expenses. Now, let's pan away from roughs and zoom in on Knock John, three nautical miles closer to the English coast. In 1965, this fort had been occupied by a former British Army Major, Paddy Roy Bates. Fond of the popular music of the time, Bates was frustrated that the BBC played the Beatles, the Kinks, and the Stones only at night. So he decided to start his own pirate radio Essex, operating from the rusty platforms of Knock John. British authorities naturally questioned the legality of Bates' enterprise. Not only were his broadcasts unlicensed, but he was occupying a UK military installation, albeit an abandoned one. But nothing on Major Roy's resume said gives up easily. The man had left home at 15 to join the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War. Upon his return, he had joined the army, becoming the youngest major in the force at the time. He had fought in North Africa and in the Middle East. He had survived a grenade explosion, a plane crash, and captivity at the hands of Greek fascist collaborators. Roy would not abandon his dream. He would just move it to somewhere else. And that somewhere else was Fort Ruffs, located beyond the limits of British territorial waters. Roy's idea was daring, but it was far from original. The platform had already been occupied by the crew of a rival pirate station, the hugely popular Radio Caroline. Caroline operated mainly from ships sailing off Britain's coast. You may know the story from Richard Curtis's movie The Boat That Rocked. At the time, Fort Ruffs was to be used as a supply station for their rocking boat, the Mi Amigo. Days before Christmas of 1966, Bates realized that the Caroline crew had left Ruffs unattended. Seizing the day, the former major stormed the fort on Christmas Eve, accompanied by a handful of friends 
friends, his 14-year-old son Michael, and a German Shepherd puppy. Radio Essex cracked back into life, pumping out Waterloo, Sunset, Ruby Tuesday, and I Am the Walrus at all hours of the day. Roy stayed on the offshore platform for months, subsisting on a diet of corned beef, rice pudding, and scotch. But his dominion over roughs was far from uncontested. Radio Caroline was about to strike back. On the 21st of June 1967, the ship Offshore 2 left Harwich with a crew of seven, eager to reconquer the platform. But Roy, Michael, and friends were ready to hold the fort whatever it took. The Caroline crew tried to climb aboard roughs, but were met with debris, empty gas cylinders, and even gasoline bombs hurled by the defenders above. The offshore do beat a hasty retreat, leaving one of their number dangling from a ladder 40 feet above sea level. The police and lifeboats intervened, rescuing the poor sod and questioning those involved, but no arrests were made. One week later, a local newspaper published what must have been their best story in decades. Radio pirates battle and pop radio pirates hurled gasoline bombs. Probably worthy of a song by the Ramones. Roy Bates had won his first battle, as Radio Caroline relented any claim over Fort Ruffs. But the Major still didn't feel entirely safe. In August of 1967, the Royal Navy set forth to destroy a nearby platform called Sunkhead Fortress. According to Michael Bates, this operation was meant as a clear signal to the Radio Essex crew. Move out, or this will be your fate. The Navy tug Collie, escorted by several helicopters, reached Sunkhead and mined it with explosives. The subsequent deflagration was strong enough to send debris flying close to Ruffs. Michael Bates, his sister Penelope, and their mother Joan were at Ruffs as the Collie sailed away from the area. The engineers on board shouted at them, you're next. At the time, Roy was on the mainland, and his heart skipped several beats when the papers wrongly reported that the Navy had demolished roughs. So how could he ensure that the authorities did not target his fort next? Now we'll get back to today's video in just a minute, but first, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators, inspiring discovery through creativity. It offers members thousands of topics to explore across the arts and social sciences, everything from graphic design and animation to marketing skills to entrepreneurship. But of course, YouTube. But unlike some platforms where you have to pay for individual topics or classes, Skillshare's premium membership scores you unlimited access to every subject available, so you can discover new skill sets in your own order at your own pace, which is pretty nice. Some of the classes you might be interested in are a bit more professionally focused, so maybe you're running a business like me and you want to take Alexandra Samuel's class on email productivity, or maybe you're an aspiring YouTuber and you want to take Barker's Brownlee's class YouTube Success Script Shoot Edit. Skillshare is a fully fleshed out service. So there's lots more to like it. New premium classes every week. Members in 150 countries with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. And philosophically, it's just great self-care, empowering you to take the time and space you need to learn something new. For you guys, Skillshare is currently giving away a free trial of its premium membership to help you explore your creativity. Just click the link in the description box below. But hurry, it's for the first thousand people only. And after that, Skillshare is still super affordable. Its annual plan works out to less than $8 per month. So give Skillshare a try. And now back to today's video. The legend goes that while Roy was out drinking with his wife Joan, she lamented that their island did not have its own flag. A friend suggested, why not make it your own country? And that was a bit of an idea. Roy consulted his lawyers. By claiming ownership over a territory that was terra nullius, nobody's land, Bates could declare that Fort Ruffs was an independent state. As such, he could keep the tentacles of British authorities at bay. On Joan's birthday, the 2nd of September 1967, Bates declared the foundation of the Principality of Sealand. Shortly afterwards, the entire Bates family moved to their realm. They were now Prince Roy, Princess Joan, and their children, Penelope and Michael. With a little bit of help from their friends, the princely family soon had their own flag, their anthem, and their motto, E Mare Libertas, from the sea, freedom. Bates and his family had created what is technically known as a seastead, a floating micronation founded from scratch on an artificial structure. Many more seasteads sprung up in the late 1960s and 70s, like Operation Atlantis, sunk by a hurricane off the Bahamas, or the Republic of Rose Island, essentially a casino on an oil platform in the Adriatic, which was raided by the Italian tax police, or the Republic of Minerva, established in Tonga's territorial waters and promptly taken over by the country's troops. To sum up, all three seasteads were doomed to fail. Only Sealand soldiered on, but it became close to a bad ending on several occasions. For starters, the British Home Office took very seriously the existence of the micronation on their doorstep. What if it became a communist stronghold? The 
UK would soon have to deal with its own Cuba. Naval and security officials considered plans to bomb the fort, but these were ultimately rejected. What the government could do was question the principality's legal status as a sovereign nation, and a good occasion to debate the issue presented itself in May of 1968. A team of workers was servicing a buoy near Sealand when they were startled by the sound of gunfire. Michael Bates was firing a 22 pistol from the fort. According to him, those were warning shots to keep the workers away from the principality's territorial waters. The government charged Michael for illegal possession and discharge of a firearm. In November, Roy and Michael were in the defendant's dock in an Essex court. This is a swashbuckling incident, perhaps more akin to the time of Sir Francis Drake, but it is my judgment that the UK courts have no jurisdiction. What the court meant was that the incident had happened outside of British territorial waters, but it could have been interpreted as a de facto recognition of Sealand's sovereignty. At least this is how Roy Bates saw it. He even later declared to an official that he could order a murder on his seastead because he was the person responsible for the law in Sealand. In the early 1970s, Prince Roy had attracted the attention of a German diamond dealer, Alexander Gottfried Archenbach. The German businessman had great plans in mind to expand Sealand. By adding to the original structure, he wanted to build a casino, a bank, a restaurant, even a square that was lined with trees. In 1975, Prince Roy appointed Archenbach as Sealand's foreign minister, and the two drafted a constitution for the principality. Then the minister sent the constitution to 150 countries and the UN seeking official recognition. But the international community was still skeptical about Sealand sovereignty. Arkenbach was growing impatient. He believed the prince and his family were not committed enough to the plan, and so he decided to take matters into his own hands. In early August 1978, Roy Bates was invited by Arkenbach to discuss future plans in Vienna. Upon his arrival, the prince learned that the meeting had been postponed for another day, but nobody showed up at the second appointment. He was growing suspicious, and with good reason. Around the same time, in the morning of the 10th of August, Michael Bates heard the whir of a rotor above Sealand. Within moments, several men had climbed down a rope ladder from a helicopter and were standing on the main platform. Michael grabbed a pistol and went to confront them, but one of the visitors reassured him that they were there to conduct some business negotiations. Michael was skeptical, but went inside to the fort's main room to pour whiskey for his guests. This was a bad move. He heard the door slamming shut behind him. He had been taken prisoner. The uninvited visitors were a small armed mercenary team sent by Mr. Arkenbach to take over the Principality of Sealand. In a classic coup d'etat scenario, a minister had dethroned his head of state. Prince Roy learned about the coup and scrambled back to England. The invaders released Michael only a few days later, but they kept hold of the fort. And now it was payback time for father and son. The two enlisted the help of John Crudson, a helicopter pilot who had worked on early James Bond movies. The small commando team flew towards Fort Ruffs at dawn, approaching from downwind to drown the din of the rotors. Michael was the first to slide down a rope ladder, shotgun in hand. The young Bates fell hard on the platform, accidentally firing a shot. It wasn't intentional, but it did the trick. The rebel faction, hearing the bullets were already going off, immediately surrendered. Prince Roy released all of his enemies, except for the leader of the invaders, one Mr. Puerts, lawyer to Foreign Minister Arkenbach. The attorney was charged with treason and locked in a makeshift jail for two months. He was allowed out only to prepare coffee and clean the toilets. The squabble had turned into a diplomatic crisis. West German officials deemed the imprisonment of Puerts an act of piracy and demanded that the British government take action, but Whitehall refused, claiming lack of jurisdiction. Eventually, Bond sent a to diplomat to Sealand to negotiate the prisoner's release. This was another act that the Bates interpreted as de facto recognition of their principality's independence. Emboldened, the royal family took further steps to reassert their nation. Sealand issued currency, passports, and even formed their own national football team. As for Mr. Puerts, he was released after paying a fine of $37,000. A couple of years later, the already puzzling incident was marred in yet more confusion. Roy Bates filed charges against one of the mercenaries who had taken over his country. His representative in court was none other than Mr. Puerts. Some reporters speculated that the whole coup had been orchestrated by the prince and the lawyer as a ploy to attract publicity and legal recognition. Since then, Mr. Arkenbach has claimed to be the only lawful ruler of the principality, forming his own government in exile. And if you have a spare moment, I invite you to take a look at the official website for the government at principality-of-sealand.ch. The homepage provides proof of the existence of Nazi flying saucers and lists the benefits of VRIL energy generators used by the real rulers of Sealand. Amongst many others, VRIL energy, whatever it may be, has positive effects on the spiritual realm. Okie dokie. It also provides opportunities to overcome the space and time ties of consciousness across incarnations without leaving space and time. Okie dokie times two. This would normally be enough to exhaust our monthly quotas of bonkers, but 
There is more to come. On the 15th of July 1997, fashion designer Gianni Versace was murdered by a spree killer, Andrew Cunanan. Eight days later, Cunanan committed suicide in a houseboat in Miami Beach. Michael Bates, by now appointed Prince Regent by his retired dad, had been following the news on TV. But the last thing he was expecting was a call from the FBI. The houseboat in Miami was owned by one Torsen Reiner, who, during the murder inquiry, had presented a Sealand passport to investigators. He even drove a Mercedes with Sealand diplomatic plates. The FBI demanded an explanation, and Michael replied that he had indeed issued some 300 passports, but not to Mr. Reinach. So what was going on? The plot thickens in 2000, when Spanish police arrest a nightclub owner called Francisco Trujillo for selling diluted fuel from a service station. But Trujillo produced a sealant passport and introduced himself as Colonel of the Principality's Armed Forces and Consul to Spain. By pulling at the thread, Spanish sleuths discovered a massive operation by which almost 4,000 forged sealant passports have been sold around the globe. Amongst their esteemed customers, this rig could boast Moroccan hashish smugglers and Russian arms dealers. Indeed, one of them had just tried to sell $50 million worth of weapons to Sudan. In theory, Trio and other passport holders could claim diplomatic immunity and evade arrest. In 2016, the Panama Papers scandal revealed that the ring had been orchestrated by a business called Sealand Trade Development Authority Limited, which had been set up by none other than Mr. Arkenbach. Journalist Ian Arbina interviewed Michael Bates about the whole murky affair, speculating whether it was all part of a plot to retake control of Sealand. More pragmatically, the Prince Regent believed they just wanted to make money off it. The entire scam, concocted by the self-proclaimed government in exile, was predicated on one condition – that Sealand be recognized as an independent sovereign country. Prince Roy Bates claimed that yes, it was, based on the two instances of de facto recognition that we already mentioned. But a de facto recognition is not a de jure recognition and it is difficult to prove. Following Roy's death in 2012, Michael became the ruling prince, and he changed his stance on the whole recognition issue. He has since stated that his micronation never expected nor asked for recognition. The point is that, according to public international law, a state does not need to be recognized to be independent and sovereign. In 2017, Professor Jacobo Rios Rodriguez, senior lecturer in public law at the University of Perpignan in France, provided his opinion on the case of Sealand. He cited the Montevideo Convention of 1933, which defines a state as an entity possessing a permanent population, a defined history, a government, and a capacity to entertain relations with other states. Now, Sealand has a permanent population and a defined territory. They are both minuscule, but nowhere does the convention establish parameters in terms of inhabitants or square miles. Size does not matter in this case. It is also undeniable that the platform nation is ruled by a permanent government. Finally, the Principality had interactions with British and German diplomacy during the critical days of the coup. Moreover, a further 13 nations worldwide had responded to communications from Sealand on the topic of investment opportunities. All in all, we could say that the micronation does have the capacity to relate with other states. With all the boxes ticked, Professor Rios Rodriguez concluded that the Principality of Sealand could objectively combine the elements peculiar to a sovereign state in spite of its peculiarities concerning its maritime character and its lack of recognition. And to reinforce our earlier point, the professor argued that recognition is not a condition for being a state. Article 3 of the 1933 Convention states, The political existence of the state is independent of recognition by the other states. The only way to visit Sealand today is to receive an official invitation from Prince Michael. If you should be graciously invited by His Highness, you would first need to endure an hour-long boat trip zigzagging across freezing, chopping waters. Fort Ruffs does not have any mooring post, landing porch, or ladder. The only way to access the surface of the Principality is to wait for the living guard, Mr. Michael Barrington, to lower a wooden seat attached to a swinging crane. Next, you could be admitted to the official seat of government, the kitchen inside a container-like structure. Here, Prince Michael himself may inspect and stamp your passport, after putting on a kettle of tea, of course. If you were to stay the night, the guest rooms are located inside one of the giant legs supporting the platform, the North Pillar. This also houses the conference room and the brig, Sealand's very own jail. Both of the fort's legs are hollowed out and stacked with circular rooms 22 feet in diameter, so plenty of space, which Prince Michael has considered monetizing by renting it out to server farms. This would be the IT equivalent of a tax haven, offshore giant service hosting all sorts of websites and databases which could benefit from high degrees of privacy, gambling, bank accounts, pornography. Michael Michael even received an offer from WikiLeaks, but it involved offering safe haven to Julian Assange, and the prince was not convinced. Quote, they were releasing more than made me comfortable. 
In the end, the server farm project did not take off due to the logistical nightmare of powering and cooling the server rooms. Moreover, the Bates family were not happy with some of the content to be hosted on their towers, pirated DVDs, among other things. Nowadays, the principality is largely financed by Michael's main line of business, cockle harvesting. Cockles are a type of mollusk best cooked in white wine with garlic, paisley, and chili. The other main source of income is Sealand's website, www.sealandgov.org. From there, you can buy all sorts of official merchandising, including a certificate granting the title of Baron or Baroness, all the way up to Duke or Duchess. You could even own one square foot of land for a period of ten years. We hope that in ten years' time, the principality of Sealand will still be safe, standing tall above the waves of the North Sea. You may love it, hate it, or ridicule it, but its story and very existence should not be ignored. The swashbuckling tales of this micronation and its rulers have raised, and will raise, profound questions about the nature of nationhood, about independence from regulation, and about how far one could go to protect their individual freedom. So I do hope that you enjoyed today's video. I also trust that Prince Michael, should he be watching, is pleased with this overview of his dominion. Your Highness, Leave us a comment if you're watching. And with that, thanks for watching.